Hey everybody, in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to create a beautiful Aurora time-lapse video. And most importantly, I'll show you how to do this without introducing any flicker. Because if you've ever tried to do a time-lapse at night, you've probably encountered this flickering problem. I will be using a combination of Adobe Bridge, Camera Raw, and Photoshop for this video. We're not gonna need any other tools. Although if you prefer using Lightroom, that would be totally fine as well. Either way, the first thing we want to do is find all of our raw photos. I captured about 300 images, and what we'll do is we'll select them all with Ctrl or Command A, then we'll right click on one of the thumbnails and choose Open in Camera Raw. As you'd probably expect, the photo is quite dark. My camera settings were f2.8, 10 seconds long, ISO 1600, with the Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter lens at 14 millimeters. Now normally, here's what I would do. I would start by increasing the exposure till we can see what's going on. Then I might lower the highlights, bring up the shadows, adjust the blacks, just play around with the sliders until it looks good. I can also go down to the color tab and make my color adjustments if I want it to be more cool, maybe have a bit more purple, add some saturation. That looks already a lot better than it did just a minute ago. But this is where you can get into trouble because the more adjustments you do, the greater chance that you're gonna have flicker in the final time lapse. And based on my test, the two main culprits for flicker are the highlights and the shadows. Therefore, I recommend you always leave the shadows and highlights set to zero. Do not touch them at all. The rest of these settings can be played around with to some degree, but if you are noticing flicker at the end of the video, then put them all back to zero and I'll show you another way to edit the photo. So the safest way to do your editing is actually not to use the light tab itself. I'd recommend you put all this back to zero and instead we're gonna be using the curve tool down here. With the curve tool, we can do more or less the same exact thing as the exposure, but this will reduce any chance for flickering. You'll likely start off in this interface, which is fairly easy to use if you know what you're doing. For example, I can add a point down here and drag it up to make the aurora a bit brighter. If things are getting too bright, like for example, if I go down further in my time-lapse sequence, let's say I'm adjusting it here. If things get too bright, then you can always add a point near the top and roll that off. That way there's not a straight line. With all that said, I understand that this tool can be difficult to use. So if you screw it all up, just reset everything by right-clicking and choosing reset channel. And if you click on this button instead, the parametric curve, this makes it much easier. It even tells you what you're going to be doing. Highlights, lights, darks, and shadows. In this case, I probably want to make the background a bit brighter. So I'll bring up the shadows as well as the darks. And then I'll bring up the highlights and lights a bit as well so it looks more natural. The problem that I'm facing though is just that my overall exposure was too dark to begin with. And so what I'm going to do is actually go back up to the light tab and just increase the exposure until things look halfway decent. This should not introduce any flicker, just playing around with the exposure by itself. Now we should have an easier time adjusting our curve. So I can continue to play around with the sliders or you can manually adjust it, whatever you're more comfortable with. Once you've made those adjustments, it would be a good idea to go back to the color tab and continue adjusting the temperature and the tint along with the saturation. Now that this image is looking good, I can sync the settings with the rest of the photos. So what I'm going to do is hit Ctrl or Command A with this thumbnail selected. That should select everything else. Next, you can click on this contextual button to sync the settings. When the pop-up appears, just hit OK. If you can't find this button or it's not showing up, you can always right click and then choose sync settings. It does the same thing. The main takeaway is that we're only using the exposure slider, the color adjustments, and then the curve. This should prevent any flickering in your final time-lapse video. The more that you play around with the shadows, the highlights, as well as the dehaze and clarity, all these could contribute to flicker, so it's best leaving them all set to zero. We're not done yet though, because if we were to zoom into the photo, we can see it's still a bit grainy, and that's most likely caused by our sharpening, which is currently under the detail tab. If you open up the detail tab, by default, sharpening is always set to 40, which might be fine during the day, but at night, this causes problems. 
therefore we want to lower the sharpening from 40 to 0. And if your photos still look a bit grainy, you can increase the luminous noise reduction just a bit, maybe 10 or 15 at the most. I might even push as far as 20 for today. We've also got a color noise reduction slider, and by default this one is set to 25. While that might be an okay setting for older cameras, I find that it actually causes problems in my photos. And that's why I'm going to start by lowering color to zero. I hope you can see this in the video, but now there's a lot of color noise caused by my camera's sensor. So what I'm going to do is increase the color slider until that disappears. And you can see the further I go, the stars actually tend to lose all their color. This is all about finding the balance point where you remove the color noise but without killing all the finer color in the photo. For my Nikon D780, a value of 10 seems to work well. This gets me a bit more color information than the default of 25. Another setting that you might be tempted to play around with is under the Optics tab. This is where you can remove chromatic aberration, as well as fix that vignette and distortion. But in this case, I think the 14 and 24 has a nice vignette that actually adds to the image. So I'm not going to worry about it. That's about all I want to do here in Camera Raw or Lightroom, whatever you're using. Again, the big thing was adjusting the exposure. Then we adjust the color and also the curve. That way the contrast looks good from the first photo to the last photo. And make sure when you are doing these changes that they're applying to all of your photos. And in this case, I was getting carried away. And so what I'm gonna do is go back to the detail tab, put sharpening to zero, luminance to 20 and color to 10. Now that I've made those changes, I'll select all of my photos once again and make sure they're synced. Now that we're here at the end of our camera raw or Lightroom workflow, it's a good idea to just look throughout the photos and make sure they all look pretty good. In this case, the aurora started off kind of subdued and then it got crazy towards the end. And unfortunately, my 240 image time lapse ended right at the peak of the aurora, which is very disappointing, but I actually started up a second time lapse, altered the composition slightly, and took a few more photos. Anyway, assuming that you've got everything syncs between your photos, the next step is to save them as JPEGs. There we go. This is the final frame of my first image sequence. So I'm going to select it, go all the way to the top, hold down the shift key, and click on the top photo. If you only have one series of images, you can just hit Control A or Command A, and that will do the same thing. With all of our thumbnails selected and all the same edits applied, the final step is to save these as JPEGs, as we talked about. You can either click on this button that looks like a download icon, or right-click Save Images, Save Images. Either way, that'll bring you into this window, and what we want to do is, first of all, choose a folder. I'm going to put this inside of my time-lapse folder. I'll call it JPEGs or whatever you want to do. As for the file name, you can stick with the original document name, but I'm going to do a three-digit serial number, starting at 001. Of course, the file extension should be JPEG, and for the quality, that's up to you. Most likely, this is going to be a 4K video, and therefore, you don't need to go a full quality of maximum. That's probably overkill. For most people, you're probably better off around quality 9. That'll give you high-quality images without necessarily the bloated file size. Or if you just want to make sure you're getting the highest quality possible, set this to 12 and that'll do the trick. The color space is sRGB because when you're watching videos that's usually the color space you want. We'll click on save. When this is finished, click on done in the lower right. This will now update all of your thumbnails with the edits that we applied to the photos. The final step is to create our time-lapse video. You can use whatever software you're more comfortable with but I'm going to be using Photoshop because it's fairly straightforward. Once you're inside Photoshop, we'll go to File, Open, navigate to our directory. In my case, this is called Time Lapse JPEGs. And you have to be very careful here. All you want to do is click on the first image and click on this checkbox that says Image Sequence. You have to do it exactly this way, otherwise you're going to open up hundreds of photos and probably crash your computer. Again, we click on the first image, Image Sequence. If for some reason this is grayed out and you can't choose it, it might be because your naming convention doesn't make sense and Photoshop doesn't realize that this should be a sequence. When you click on open, it will ask you for the frame rate for the video project. 
I recommend doing 24 FPS. That way you get the most out of the photos that you captured because you only need 24 photos per one second of video. Whereas if you do 30 or even 60, now you would need 60 photos per one second of video. And because I only have 240 images, that would not last very long at all. But if I do 24, that gives me 10 seconds of video. So that's what I'm gonna do. Next, we'll go to Window and choose Timeline. When we go to Window, Timeline, this gives us a new set of tools to help edit our video. We can scrub through it pretty easily and look for flickering, and also decide if our color adjustments look good or not. One of the nice things is because we're editing this in Photoshop, we have access to all of our adjustment layers. For example, maybe I want to do a color balance layer. This will apply to the entire video and it shouldn't cause any flickering. So I might want to make it maybe a bit more blue, add some green or magenta. You know, I'm just playing around with it right now to give you some ideas. You can also add a curves adjustment layer and maybe make things a bit brighter or add some contrast, whatever you want to do. Anyway, once you've made your adjustments or maybe not, all we have to do is go to File, Export, Render Video. Again, that's File, Export, Render Video. If for some reason you can't even open the dialog box for the video export, this is happening to me twice now, the solution is pretty simple. Just close out of it, close out of Photoshop, and then redo those steps. It's unfortunate we have to do that, but it's happened on two different computers. I'm not really sure what the main problem is. Again, we click on our first photo, image sequence, 24 frames per second. That's really all you have to do. Then go to File, Export, Render Video. There we go. I don't know why I couldn't do that before, but uh, the first thing we'll adjust is the name. I'll call this Aurora Time Lapse 1. And as I look down at my settings, I do notice one potential problem. The size of the video is 4096 by 2304. That means I'm gonna have black bars on the sides of my video when I play this on any 16 by nine display. I personally am not worried about it, so I'm just gonna render this anyway. But if you wanna have a 16 by nine ratio, what I would do is cancel out of this, grab the crop tool from the left-hand toolbar, change the ratio, to 16 by nine, and then adjust your composition to fit nicely. The bottom of my frame doesn't really have anything of use. I'd rather see the more of the sky, so that's what I'll do. Once you've got the composition looking good, click on the check mark icon at the top. Now you have your 16 by nine ratio. It would also be a good idea to scrub through the time-lapse and make sure that the crop works for the entire video. If you realize that the crop wasn't perfect, you can always go to your history tab, undo the crop, maybe look at a different part of the time lapse and try it again. With our new 16 by nine ratio, we'll go back up to file, export, render video. And for the size, we'll do 3840 by 2160. That should be the 4K resolution. Don't forget to rename your video and verify it is in a folder where you can find it. The final step is to click on render and you should be good to go. The video has now finished rendering. Let's open it up and take a look. Well, that looked pretty good. There really wasn't any flickering to notice. And the only problem I saw was down at the bottom, but that was actually the roar itself, nothing that we did. If you decide that the colors aren't quite perfect though, or the contrast could use some adjustment, then that's why we've got Photoshop still opened up. So what you'd want to do is go back to your adjustments tab and for example, I could do a selective color if I think maybe I want those reds to stand out a bit better. And then from here, I'll make my adjustments. I will say though that when you're doing this selective color, you have to be careful because it might look good at one particular part of the time lapse, but if you scrub to a different part, it might look pretty awful. So just make sure before you commit any of these changes, you go through the whole thing. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. I hope this video helps you out and I'll see you in another tutorial.